Hi, this is Ask GMBN Tech, the Q&A session. You ask the questions, we hopefully give you some answers to help you fix your bikes. Uh, if you are struggling with anything tech on your bike, uh, get involved in the comments underneath. Use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech. Uh, you can also email us, there's going to be a link in the description underneath for that. Right, first question, suspension related from Daz. Says, Doddy, I recently went off a relatively large drop and after the impact, I noticed a weird sound coming from my bike. Through further inspection, I realized my Fox 34 Rhythm was making a squishing sound when I compressed it very slightly, about two millimeters. Uh, what could have happened after that impact had my seals been damaged? Now, I'm not sure about this. I don't think it's the compression because any noise you tend to get from a suspension fork tends to be from rebound when it returns uh, because of the fact the way the oil is pulled back through the ports, it tends to make a bit more of a sort of kind of noise, uh, if that makes sense. But, well, firstly, to start with, unwind your rebound um, so the fork is really bouncing fast and see if the noise disappears. If it's the case, then yes, it was the rebound. Uh, and all that's happened probably is you've used absolutely all of the travel and the fork's doing its job. Oil cycling through ports and shims is gonna make noise. Forks are not quiet by any means. Uh, you probably just haven't noticed it before. That said, um, it could be cavitation, which is another thing. So when air and oil mix together, uh, you get like air bubbles, yeah, and, and that is the noise you could be hearing. Uh, but if that's the case, then you will have inconsistent damping. So I do suspect it's a rebound, but there is a chance it's cavitation. And I say that because you've got the 34 rhythm. So there's two major types of damper in a fork. So I'm just gonna try and explain these for you. Right, so this is actually one from a RockShox fork, so it's a bit different, but the concepts are similar. So this is a bladder style damper. So you've got your rebound down here and you've got your compression at the top. You think as it squashes down through the travel, this piston that's running through this bit, you can see in the cutaway here and here when I move it, that's forcing the oil this way. So this is the compression damper. And what happens is this bladder expands to compensate for that. That's where the oil goes. But in your Fox fork, it's a little bit more like, uh, this is in particular with the 34 rhythm that you've got. It's a bit more like a rear shock. So it has an IFP in there. So an IFP moves basically to allow for expansion as well but it's not an air IFP, it's a spring-loaded IFP. So, I mean, I'd find it very strange if any air managed to get around it, and I've never heard of that, but there is a slight chance that's happened. Uh, but I do suspect it's your rebound, so give that a try uh, and see what's happened, but I don't think you've damaged it. Sounds like it's just doing its job to me. Uh, right, next question from Clemens. My hands are between glove size small and medium. I'm running 30 millimeter grips and the brake levers towards horizontal, which has been as in quite upright, uh, which is totally fine on my local trails until I went to Lear Gang and the braking bumps absolutely killed me. Well, to be fair, the braking bumps at Lear Gang absolutely kill any, anyone, full stop, whatever you're riding. Um, I had to stop up to five times a run though due to sore fingers. In the end, it was so bad, I had to ask my friend to open my fingers for me as I wasn't able to do any more. Uh, what can I do about that? Uh, I'll tell you what, that's the old crab hands, that is. Um, I, it makes me remember, nostalgically, uh, my first ever trip to Whistler, went there with a friend, and we were so excited to ride, literally straight, what was it, like an eight hour flight for us, I think? Got to Vancouver, got on a Greyhound Express, Whistler Express, um, all the way to Whistler, got our bikes out, literally as soon as we got there, when we did 10 runs of A-Line. Uh, by the end of it, couldn't even pick up a beer glass because both of us, our hands were like, trying to close up. Uh, that's what happens when you just hit things too hard. Right, so hand and finger pain can be down to a number of different things, and it can take some people a long time to figure it out. Uh, and it's not always what you think it might be. So you're getting finger pain, but that can be because your whole hand is strained. Uh, it could be because your hand is getting lots of impact. There's a lot of different things to take into account. So here's just a few things that you can try. The first one is your bar roll and your bar height. Uh, they all affect the position and how much you're loaded on the front end of the bike. The more pressure on your hands, the harder your hands are gonna be working. Yeah, you wanna be bearing the weight on your feet and on your hips and your knees if you can when you're riding. Uh, I appreciate the fact that this might require new handlebars. So obviously you wanna try all these other solutions first to see if this can remedy. Um, okay, so first thing, lever blade position. So running them horizontal, that's a good thing because it puts your hands in a strong, sort of a, a powerful position on the bars and you're not overreaching, straining your wrist. That's a good thing. But the throw of your brake levers, i.e. your bite point, something like that, uh, the closer your brake levers can be to the handlebars and you wanna use like this part of the knuckle on your finger, it's a really powerful place because your hand is already partially closed. The further away your brake levers are and nearer to the end of your fingers you're using, although you've got loads of leverage to do that, it's really quite difficult for your fingers. 
Now I like to run my brake levers like that a lot of the time, but actually when I run Alpine or big sort of big terrain stuff with long repeated runs, I'll run them closer to the bar, so I'm basically just squeezing on the brakes. Uh, I know a lot of riders that do that, so that is definitely something worth experimenting with. Um, what else have I got written down here? So grip thickness, actually, it's not always the one so um, to look at because although statistically, if you've got small hands, you should have small grips and big hands have big grips. Not always the case. I've got quite big hands, so I'm large or like 10 or 11 in gloves. Um, I tend to run the thinnest grips possible for probably nine out of 10 types of riding. And then if it's a really rough place or if I'm going on a trip somewhere like a Whistler or a Lear game, I've been inclined to take some bigger, more padded grips with me. Now in the past, I've used mushroom profile grips by ODI because they're insanely cushioned. I don't like the feel of them back at home because I like the thin connection to the bike, but all that vibration that's absorbed by a grip like that can also lead to hand and finger pain. So another thing to factor in there. Um, and even your handlebars. So if you're running really stiff handlebars, that will translate through to hand pain and you just might not be aware of it. So there are loads of things to take into account. And of course, the number one that many people accidentally get wrong, tire pressure. Front tire pressure, even lowering it by a pound or two can make a significant difference. It is the first point of call between your bike and the ground. If you can eliminate that vibration coming through at that point, your hands aren't gonna be working quite as hard. Uh, but I'm sorry, there's no specific answer for this. You're gonna need to experiment a bit, but be patient with it. And it does take a while to find this. And actually some people will never completely get the correct solution. You can just make things a bit better. You know, you've forever seen people shaking out hands after runs. And even riders, you know, the caliber of Steve Pitt, he mentioned in one of his recent videos that he was getting hand pump. You know, it's, just, uh, it's not a thing that just goes away if you're prone to it, but you can try and make it a bit better. So hopefully some of those ideas will help you. Good luck with that. Um, actually, I should have said suspension settings as well uh, can al always help. If you're running slightly too firm at the front end, that's not going to help you. So next question is from Jamie Waters. Doddy, loving the show. I've brought a brand new Trek Marlin 6 about a year and a half ago, and I think it's time to upgrade the 100mm travel coil fork to 120mm travel air fork. Only problem is that all half decent air forks need a 15mm through axle. My bike has a quick release skewer. So how would I convert my quick release skewer to a 15mm axle? Uh, if I'm honest, I'm not sure you can because it does depend totally on the hub that you're using. Now, I haven't actually, I don't think I've got a hub here. I can show you them right by me. I haven't, unfortunately. Uh, but some hubs have caps on the end. You pull the caps out and it might have quick release or it might have 20mm or 15mm or boost or non boost and you can replace those end caps. So have a look at yours, remove the quick release skewer from it and see if they're like pull out style, um, like almost like plugs on the end. If you can remove them, it will be a spare part that you can get, plug in the 15 mil ones and you're good to go. If not, you're gonna need a new hub laced onto that rim or a new front wheel, unfortunately. Uh, but you will need to check with that particular hub, unfortunately. Uh, next question, Harry Bryson. Will clamping a carbon frame on a bike rack eventually damage the carbon. When you say bike rack, um, do I assume you mean like on a car, like a roof rack or something like that? Uh, if so, well, it's not ideal clamping and carbon tubes uh, by any means, but it depends on the manner of it. So for example, uh, Thule make a roof rack called the Pro Ride, I think it's called, one just clamps on the down tube. That would actually be all right because the fact the weight of the bike is being loaded on the wheels. So provided that the actual clamp can go over the down tube and securely clamp the bike, it'll be fine because it's not catering for the weight. Uh, but they don't always fit bikes with weird shaped down tubes. So I, I use one called the, I think it's called the All Ride. I'm gonna, no, Upride, that's what it's called. And it clamps the front wheel and the back wheel. I actually made a video about bike racks a while back. So uh, there's gonna be a link to that in the description underneath. We look at roof racks, um, I don't know, once I've gone on the back and towable racks and things like that, just looking at different fitments and things. But clamping carbon, if it's uh, gonna be hanging off there, what you wanna do is make sure it can't move in any way. You don't want any sort of additional force to go into that clamp. Um, make sure it's nice and padded and can, the load can be spread out. Use a t-shirt, something like that, if it's on a bike rack, and just don't over clamp it. Try and spread the load out by using cable ties or perhaps toe straps in another place. If at all possible, try and avoid clamping a carbon tube because of the fact, yes, you can damage them. Uh, it's down to you just to manage that. So just take care with that one. Uh, next one's from the Boss of Bread. That's a good name, what did you do? You a baker? Hmm, interesting. So what do you think about removing the seal off a frame bearing which, which is a bit gritty and blowing the crap out of them and repacking them with grease? I've done it many a time with no ill effects, just wondered on your thoughts. Uh, yeah, I've done that many a time on various different bearings, but it doesn't always work 
because sometimes, let's face it, by the time the bearing gets that gritty, um, it's already shot to pieces. So if the bearing's in good condition, there's nothing stopping you removing those seals very delicately, taking the grease out and putting fresh grease in. Then you'll get loads more use out of them. But let's face it, most of us, I know myself included, and perhaps you, I don't know, um, if you're needing to do this, the bearings might be shot in the first place. So bear in mind, you're not gonna get in, like, more use out of a bearing that's already knackered. You'll only increase the use of a bearing that's in good condition and you wanna put fresh grease in, if that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, there's nothing wrong with doing that, provided it's not already worn. Uh, I wanna say worn, any play or if it's feeling slightly notchy, anything like the obvious like that. Uh, next one from Alex Cato. Will a steel chainring potentially make a chain cassette last longer than an aluminium chainring? Seeing as steel has a higher wear resistance than aluminium, uh, so the chainring's teeth will not wear as quickly, then the cassette will last longer as the chain's not wearing as quickly. Uh, yeah, kind of in theory, the way you're thinking, yeah, I guess. I've not tried them side by side, but uh, the real reason they make steel chainrings is, what, well, they're cheap. Basically, um, yes, they do last longer than alloy rings, but they're cheaper and they're heavier. But that doesn't necessarily mean because the fact the teeth themselves are harder than they are an alloy that it's going to wear your chain uh, any more or any less. So the bits that wear on a chain, you have the inner and outer plates. And on those plates is like a little sort of a rounded dome almost, and that sits with the roller around it. Now that roller, eventually in use with grit and stuff in the chain, gets almost like um, bored out from the inside and then it gets a little bit baggy and then the chain pitch effectively changes. So that's gonna happen just through the use of the chain. Granted, if all of your all of the sprocket teeth are in perfect condition, yeah, arguably, it could last a bit longer, but um, I'm not sure anyone's actually tested that side by side. I think it's more a case of the chain is gonna wear. Um, you have to make sure you replace the components before you um, risk having to replace the cassette first, if that makes sense. But uh, interesting to think about that. Uh, Nick Higgins, Doddy, why are mountain bikes mainly geared towards taller and larger riders? All the bikes I'm looking at have really long reach or don't have compatible sizing with my height. Uh, I'm 157 centimeters with a 70 centimeter inseam, so inside leg for other users there. Any advice on how to make sure a bike is the right fit for me? Well, I wouldn't say bikes are like, geared towards taller riders. I think it's more a case of it's always been harder to make bikes for taller riders because you upset the balance of the bike, whereas it's easier technically on a bit of paper to make a bike smaller because the balance is gonna be easier to achieve, if that makes sense. But that said, wheel sizes has definitely made it an issue for bikes, but there's loads of shorter riders out on the World Cup scene. Uh, Emily Batty, for example, she rides very small bikes and still manages to ride 29 inch wheels. So uh, those bikes do work for her. Now, typically I'd say you're probably an extra small, maybe a small in some brands. The best best thing to do really is to look at some of the major bike brands, I'm gonna say Specialized Trek, Canyon, brands like that that have uh, geometry charts that are quite advanced and they have bike fit built into their websites. Um, can you use Canyon and Trek in this case? So on the Trek website, I just looked up the Trek Pro Caliber. It's a hardtail cross country bike. Size 15 and a half inch, has a three, uh, 395 millimeter reach and it's perfect for your inside leg. And then also on the Canyon website, I looked at the Exceed. Uh, that's another hardtail, but the same thing applies in, in full size bikes. Uh, extra small, has a reach of 392 millimeters. Um, and that's using their calculator for your height and for your inseam. So it, there's kind of good advice out there. So you're probably looking between 39, well you probably you could say as little as 385 and as much as 395 reach. It's probably your sort of region there. Uh, but of course, making sure the inside leg is gonna suit you there. Now Canyon on some of their smaller bikes offer them in 27 and a half inch wheels and on their bigger frame sizes, they offer them in 29 inch wheels to get around any clearance issues to in theory, tailor a smaller bike to better fit you. Uh, so by all means, look around on some of these websites and the advice on them is actually pretty good. Um, most, most of the time, probably nine times out of 10, you're gonna get a good fit. Uh, but nothing will beat though, going out and actually trying a bike in the flesh, because I mean, hey, you haven't said which style bikes you like. You might like a trail bike or an enduro bike. And in which case, if you're going for bikes with suspension on, you're probably gonna have to have the smaller size wheels. Well, 27 and a half, it's not exactly small. Um, because of the clearance, you're gonna get the problems you're gonna have with the wheel moving with the amount of suspension travel. Uh, but again, geometry charts and bike fit finders on the major websites are a good place to start so you can sort of understand your sizing. And um, we've actually made a video on how to choose the right size bike. Uh, so keep an eye out for that one on GMBN Tech. Hopefully that will have some tips in there for you as well. 
And the last question this week is from Will Lange, who says, who asks, uh, incredibly helpful information every week. Oh, thank you. Uh, we try. Um, especially for those who are hard on their things. What's your advice on creaking interfaces or newer fork crowns and stanchions? Ooh. Is using Loctite sick? No, no, no. If your if your crown or anything like that is is creaking, you're cruising for an early trip to the dentist, mate. Right? There's a good chance because of the fact that the, so the upper legs, so like the stanchion tubes, are pressed into the crown, as is the steerer tube. Now you can get fresh steerer tubes repressed into the crown, but if the actual stanchion tubes are creaking in that crown my best advice honestly would be to look on the back of the crown or perhaps the front depending on which brand there should be a, a part number or a code sometimes a qr code uh, scan it or get the code and go onto a relevant manufacturer website and there should be somewhere you can type that code in uh, and they will let you know basically if there's any warranty recalls on that you think how many thousands of these things are produced it's only going to take like one to slip through that's just not being quite um you know, put together quite right. And um, yeah, you don't want to mess with that sort of thing. If in doubt, contact the distributor or the manufacturer direct, and it could be a warranty claim, in which case they would send you a new crown steer upper unit that won't creak. Uh, but yeah, be cautious with that because the fact it's press fitted. If any of that stuff works loose, uh, not very good. Okay, well, hopefully there were some uh, good questions in there and hopefully they've been helpful for you. Uh, please do get involved in the comments underneath, ask us more questions, and hopefully we can help you. See you in the next show.